My name is Aaron Bertrand. I'm here to talk about. Uh, first thing I want to do is I want to talk about the sponsors. I've been speaking for 10 years, and it doesn't matter how big or how small a conference is or how much it costs to go from free to $5,000. I've been to conferences of all kinds. And the one constant that makes these work is sponsors. So please take your moment to, uh, to visit the sponsors in the hall and make sure they feel like uh, it was worth their time coming. So, uh, How's the translation, by the way? This is the first time I've tried this feature. It's very bad? <laughs> OK, I'm, I'm not shocked by this. It is Microsoft. Um, so I apologize for that. If, you, if it's really distracting, I can turn it off if anybody wants me to turn it off. But um, anyway. So like I said, my name is Aaron Bertrand. I work for Century One. We make a bunch of uh, monitoring software and DevOps software for the Microsoft Data Platform. I grew up in Canada. So uh, when I come to Europe, people say, ah, stupid American. But um, I'm actually Canadian. And uh, <laughs> I, I write for MS SQL Tips. And I run a couple of blogs, blogs.century1.com and sqlperformance.com. And I'm a community moderator on uh, the Database Administrator Stack Exchange. It's like Stack Overflow, but for databases. And we have a free tool called Plan Explorer. And if you tune queries, but don't use Plan Explorer, you're doing yourself a huge disservice. It's a, a much more obvious way to solve execution plan uh, issues. I'm also a very bad travel planner. So I don't know how many people in the audience were expecting to attend my workshop yesterday, but uh, I had to cancel that because I had multiple um, mishaps, multiple things went wrong uh, on my flights to come over here. So I wasn't able to get here until late yesterday afternoon. So that. Uh, that had to be canceled, and I, uh, I offer um, extreme condolences, extreme apology for that. I'm very sorry. So after the apology, let's move on with the content. So I want to talk about five different areas uh, of things that have been improved in more recent versions of SQL Server, and they cover administration, security, availability, performance, and programmability. So there are five different areas, and it's just a way to kind of chop things up and, and segment things up into, into different pieces. So the first one is about uh, administration. And so um, one thing that they, or, or a couple of things that they've done to really enhance the way that you develop uh, on SQL Server. So for a long time, people would have, uh, they would install standard edition or express edition, and they have different feature sets or, um, and, and different uh, hardware limitations on memory and how many CPUs it could use and those things. Uh, or people would get evaluation edition and they would develop using evaluation edition on their desktop, but they deployed a standard edition. So they would use things like, ooh, what's this partitioning feature? This looks awesome. Let's use that. And then they would deploy to production and it's no longer um, available. And uh, people would also use developer edition, but it cost uh, I think it was $59 for a long time, and then for a couple of years it was $49. Um, now Developer Edition is free. They started that in 2016. So you can now use Developer Edition on as many workstations as you want, and you don't have to worry about licensing or, or matching things. Uh, and they also made Management Studio free. That used to, be, that used to require a license, uh, and now you can actually use the full version of Management Studio for free. Most Enterprise Edition features are now in all editions. So for a long time, like I said, partitioning, you couldn't do that in, in other editions, and now you can. There are all kinds, of, all kinds of features that they've just opened up and said, it doesn't matter what edition you use. If you have standard edition, you can all use all of these enterprise edition features now, um, and your only limitation is the hardware, the hardware limits. Uh, there are a few exceptions to that. Online index operations are not supported, but uh, this is a, a little uh, table that I made to show the different uh, the different features that are available in the additions, and you see there are only a couple of exceptions. Change data capture, you can't do in Express or LocalDB. And uh, in memory, OLTP, you can't do in LocalDB. So there are just a couple of little things that you can't do. But almost everything else, the surface area is the same. So it doesn't matter if you're developing locally on Express and deploying to standard. You can use all of the, uh, all of the functionality in SQL Server, again, with a, a couple of exceptions. Linux. How many people use Linux workstations somewhere? Oh, yeah, we got a few. OK. Uh, and Macs, how many people use Macs? More Linux than Macs. That can't be right. OK, well, um, 
So for a long time, SQL Server was Windows only, right? You could only run SQL Server on Windows. You could only run Management Studio on Windows. Um, they're opening this space up completely so that your operating system is no longer, your operating system is just a vehicle. It doesn't really matter uh, where you're running. I'm running this demo. I'm not going to use Windows. All these demos are running on a container on my Mac host. I don't have to run a Windows VM. My battery life is like quadrupled because of that. Uh, there are all these, all these little benefits you get to not caring where it's running, right? So they're really opening up everything. There's some new DDL commands. So uh, for things that uh, you would have to do, for example, uh, if you had to drop a table, if you just say drop table, whatever, you get an error message if it didn't already exist, right? And so you would have all this complicated code that would say if exists this object or if object ID is not null, um, run the delete. And so you end up creating all these forks of logic in your code that handle these scenarios. And uh, so now there's a command that says drop table if exists, and then you list the table name or table names. Uh, and it will just try to drop those. And if it, if it exists or not, the, the statement succeeds. And so you can call it 500 times. It doesn't matter uh, because the first time it succeeds, and the next time the table's not there, but it still succeeds. When they did that, I, I was kind of mad that they didn't do something for procedures. So um, there's, a, there's this whole sequence of logic that you have to prepare when you are deploying stored procedures, and you have new procedures mixed with procedures that have changed. Um, and so what was missing was the ability to say, I want to create this procedure. The reason, uh, or I want to create this procedure if it doesn't exist, but I want to alter it if it does. And this has existed in Oracle for decades, I'm sure. Um, but it was missing, missing from SQL Server. So you would have all this convoluted logic that says, if this store procedure exists, uh, drop it. And then you would have your create script. But it has to be in a separate batch. So you can't say if else, because the create procedure had to be in its own batch. Uh, so then people would have dynamic SQL. So they would put this whole big stored procedure body into a dynamic SQL and, ex and execute it. And uh, the solutions around that were really ugly. So now you're able to just say, create or alter. And so this, you have one copy of the store procedure. That's the whole batch. So there's no if logic. And it either creates it if it doesn't exist, or it'll alter it if it does. So a lot more powerful for deployments. Are there some new service broker commands? How many people use service broker? OK, so oh, oh there are a couple. OK, I was just going to skip past it. So you can now reorganize a, a service broker queue which if, you've, if you have a very busy service broker implementation, you'll probably find after over time that the performance kind of goes downhill a little bit. That's probably due to uh, fragmentation in the queue. And so you can measure that now with the same, same ways that you measure fragmentation for an index. Um, you can also now move it to a different file group. So if you find that it's interfering with your other I.O. activities, you can move it to a file group just like you would for a partition or uh, putting indexes on a different file group, that kind of thing. You can now truncate by partition. So um, I, I just I don't like that they spent engineering resources to make pretty syntax for this. So you can list the partitions, but now you can say five, two, seven, um, which I just I feel like there are things in SQL Server that they could have been working on other than making that syntax work. If I have to type five, six, seven there, I think I'm okay. Um, but I guess if you're if you have fifteen thousand partitions in your table, maybe that is kind of handy. But um, anyway. So a quick demo. All right, so just is that big enough, by the way? Do I need to make it bigger? Anybody? It's OK? Perfect? OK, great. So I'm um, just in TempDB. And uh, today, if I want to drop a user that doesn't exist, I'm going to get an error message, right? Cannot drop this user. Uh, that font is definitely not big enough, but you get an error message about cannot drop the user. But now I can just say drop user if exists, and then the, and then the username. And I can run this as many times as I want. It will never fail. Um, so you don't want to do that if you actually want to capture the case that you tried to drop a user that didn't exist. But if you just want the script to succeed, whether the user existed or not, this is a, a very nice way to do that. Uh, s same thing here. So this is the kind of logic people would have, right? If object ID of some procedure name is not null, um, drop the procedure. And then if the object ID or, um, yeah, so I'm trying to drop two objects here, right? So if these objects don't exist, I have all this code that says if this one is, 
if this one exists, drop it. If this one exists, drop it. That gets very bulky very fast. Uh, but now I can just say drop procedure if exists, and I have co uh, comma separated names, and this will never fail. Uh, where did my messages go? There we go. All right, so I can run this over and over and over again. It will never fail. Same thing with the table. So drop table if it exists, and then I can create the table, and this will work no problem. And I can run this drop table as many times as I want, and it will never fail. That allows me to do this without having all this if logic in here to check if the table exists already. How many people are using Azure Data Studio yet? Only a few? Yeah. So I'm having this issue where every once in a while it gets into this stuck state where it, you can't cancel and you can't run. Mixed demos, fun, or something. Anyway, you can trust me that this stuff works. I don't know what's going on with my window, but um, these, are, these are the ways that people used to solve this problem. So if object ID is not null, exact this store procedure that says alter right, or uh, else exec a store procedure or uh, exec a script that creates. Or they'll say create this store procedure and they'll make a, a very basic stub. That's just create procedure as select one, and then they'll run their alter script. So they don't have to put the alter in dynamic SQL at least, uh, which makes it a little bit easier to, like, if the store procedure doesn't already exist, you just put something there that's just a placeholder until you get to run your alter. That at least uh, prevents you from having to duplicate the body of the store procedure. Um, but I would argue that this is far simpler, much easier to work with. Right. Okay, moving on. Some new dynamic management objects. So sysdm exec input buffer. Uh, this was created to allow you to use sysdm exec requests or sysdm exec sessions and cross apply that to this dynamic management function. Uh, which allows you to get the input buffer for all of those sessions at the same time, instead of creating a loop and using DBCC input buffer. Right? And there are a couple of benefits to doing that. One is you can deal with these results in a set-based fashion, so you can deal with all those results at once. You don't have to create a temp table to put the DBCC input buffer commands into. Uh, and you also don't have to use sysadmin anymore, right? because you can use uh, more granular permissions to um, affect this, this object instead of the sysadmin that's required for dbcc input buffer. Sysdmdb page info. This allows you to get info about a page without using the undocumented uh, dbcc ind and dbcc page. Anybody use those for troubleshooting the contents of a page? Yeah, a couple. Right? So this will be much easier to use. Uh, there's a new DMV for uh, stats histograms. So previously, the only way you could get a histogram was to call dbcc function. And so for the same reason, they're trying to eliminate the, uh, all of the places where sysadmin is explicitly required and allowing you to decide who gets to look at histograms, who gets to look at input buffer. And you can, you can dole that out instead of just having to give sysadmin to everybody who has to do any one of these things. And now you can really um, separate those roles out. SysDMDB log stats. Previously, the only way to get information about uh, virtual log files, VLFs, in your, in your log file uh, was to call dbcc log info. Well, now they put that into a DMV as well. SysDM exec wait, uh, session wait stats. So there's a SysDM OS wait stats where you could get instance wide waits. And so what a lot of people would do is they would start, they would look at SysDM OS wait stats and they would say, what are all my waits right now? And then they would run some query. And then they would look at sysdmos wait stats again. And they would subtract. They would find the deltas between all of those weights. And they would say, oh, OK, these are the weights I caused, or these are the weights that I suffered from. Uh, the problem is that those are instance wide. So unless you're the only person on the system and nobody else is able to connect, you can't say for sure that all of those deltas and weights were, uh, had anything to do with you. So what this DMV does is it adds a column. So it has the same information that's in sysdmos wait stats, but it groups it by session. So you can see which are, what are the weights that I actually, that I happened in my session. So it's a little more powerful. And then sysdm exec function stats, so you can get, um, uh, just like sysdm exec procedure stats and, and dm exec query stats, you can get uh, st statistics about how fast and how, or how slow your functions are running. 
There's a new concept called database scope configuration. This was introduced in 2016. Uh, this allows you to control things at a database level instead of an instance level. So things like Maxstop. So anybody run SharePoint? So if you have SharePoint on an instance of SQL Server, what does Microsoft tell you? You have to run Maxstop 1, right? Uh, I think Dynamics is the same. So you have these situations where you might want to have SharePoint on a system with other things. Actually, I would probably leave it on its own system, but um, you, you might want to have things where you have specific databases that need to have certain settings, uh, but you don't want that to apply to all of your databases. right? So this allows you to set these things at the database level. So I can say, I want this SharePoint database on this instance to be maxed up one, but everybody can, have, can use multiple uh, processors. You can set uh, things that there's a trace flag 4136 that applies to the instance uh, that affects parameter sniffing. And you can now turn this on and off per database. So if you have this particular issue only in one database and you don't want those settings to apply to the others, you can set it just for that one. There's some optimizer fixes. Every time uh, SQL Server comes up with a new service pack or a new, uh, a new version that puts, or a new uh, compatibility level, it puts all of these optimizer fixes that have happened over time that you see in knowledge base articles. Those come under this trace flag 4199. And you can turn those optimizer fixes on until the next version where they will come into effect. Uh, but you might not want to do that for every database. You might have certain workloads that, uh, where those fixes actually don't help, they hurt. And so this is a, another way that you can set that per database. Legacy cardinality estimator, same thing. And if anybody has uh, upgraded from an older version to 2014 or better, you might have seen that uh, a lot of your query plans now are better, but you might have had some that tanked, right? So you have some that, uh, some regressions in your query performance because the new cardinality estimator uh, actually does a worse job for certain uh, query shape, query plan shapes. And so th this is another case where you might want to turn that on for some databases, but not for all. Um, so you can, you can decide per database how to do that without using the compatibility level. You can clear the plan, plan cache for an in individual database instead of uh, clearing it for the whole server. So if you have developers that are sharing an instance of SQL Server, you don't have to. Um, you can do it by database so that one developer can say, I want to clear the plan cache for my database without affecting these other users who are in the middle of their testing or uh, perform, you know, doing performance tuning. You can make online indexing and resumable indexing uh, the default. So online is something that's been around for a while. You can say, create this index and do it online. What that does is it makes a copy of the index and allows existing queries, uh, while the index is being created or rebuilt, it allows existing queries to use uh, the older, you know, the original copy of the index. Resumable is a new uh, feature in 2017, I believe. Did that come in 2017? This one I don't even remember. But it allows you to, um, it allows you to say, I want to make this index creation resumable so that uh, if I get halfway through creating this index and the server crashes, um, I can restart the next time the server starts up. Or if I have a maintenance window of two hours, I can say run for two hours and then stop. And then when my next wi maintenance window comes up, we'll finish building this index. And that allows you to have this copy of an index and you don't lose all of that work that you did. Kind of like the difference between fragmentation and creating indexes today, where uh, th with fragmentation, if you get halfway done, you don't lose any of that work if, if you stop. But with creating an index, you do. Because if you stop halfway through creating an index, it rolls it all back. So this resumable is a way to, uh, to avoid that. Uh, and you can set it so that you can have that behavior without even specifying it in the syntax. You can also do things like um, uh, apply things only to a secondary. So if you have an availability group and you have, uh, let's say, the optimizer fixes, right? For, so you want 4199 to take place or to take effect on the secondaries, but not on your primary instance. You can have that separation as well. There are a bunch of settings. I'm not going to go through all of these, but uh, the, the set uh, keeps growing over the last few versions, and I expect we'll continue to do so. Some security things. So they added a feature in 2016 called dynamic data masking. I'm almost I'm hesitant to put this under security because it's not really security. It's more obscurity. So you can do things like make an email address look like it's from at xxx.com. So everybody's email address looks the same instead of seeing Gmail or whatever the, whatever the domain name happens to be. You can hide people's salary. Um, 
but it's not really a security feature because there are many ways where you can find out the information that it's masking, right? It's just put, it's basically changing the output of the data. The data doesn't change. It's not like encrypting um, or preventing access to data. It's just kind of massaging it and making it look a little different. There's a new uh, uh, feature called session context. So anybody use context info to, to put information, like session variables? So problems with that, it's a binary string, or it's a binary value. Uh, it's limited to 128 bytes. It's not read-only, so you can have people that come in, and if um, one of the use cases that I had for it at my last job was I would use context info for a tenant. So I had a multi-tenant system, and this context info would indicate the tenant, so I didn't have to pass tenant ID around between all these procedures. Uh, but someone com could come in and say set context info and change their tenant ID if they knew how to, if they knew what the values were and they knew what another tenant's ID was, um, they could easily impersonate a different tenant. So with this, you actually have the ability to, when a person logs in, you can uh, call a store procedure that says set this, set their tenant to this value and make that read only that prevents them from being able to actually change it during their session. Um, and it also supports uh, 256K instead of 128 bytes, so you can store a lot more um, session information in there. 2016 also added row-level security. This is a way to, uh, without coding into your store procedures and your, and your queries and your views, uh, what rows people can access, you actually apply a security um, you, it's basically a security function that indicates how a person is able to access a row. So you say um, if this person is a manager or it's the employee ID matches the employee ID on the row. So you can prevent people from looking at other employees' data unless they're also a manager or even more specifically their manager. Um, and then sysadmin obviously gets, uh, gets to look at all of it. Uh, so it's a, a really nice way to um, s abstract the ability or abstract your um, applying security uh, away from the code. So the query doesn't have to say, if this person is a manager, you can run this query. The, the, um, the query against that table will automatically filter out rows that they're not allowed to see. Right. Um, just be careful about query plans. It does affect the query plans. They also added always encrypted. So one of the, uh, a lot of people use, how many people use TDE? Anybody use transparent data encryption? Okay, so some of the problems with TDE, it's only at rest, right? So it's only on the, on the disk. If you bring that data into memory, it becomes unencrypted. Uh, it goes over the wire unencrypted. So you have all these access points where man in the middle attacks can actually see the data because it's, it's surfaced unencrypted. Uh, and so what Always Encrypted does is it allows you to um, separate that completely. So it stays encrypted when it's on the wire. It stays encrypted in memory even. <coughs> One of the other problems with TDE is if you're a sysadmin, I can, I can very easily get access to the data in that database. Right? There's, nothing, there's nothing that stops a sysadmin from getting to the TDE database. With Always Encrypted, there's a client certificate that's used to decrypt the data so you can separate if you uh, have that need, you can separate the sysadmin role from the security admin role, and therefore you can prevent a sysadmin from automatically have accessing access to all the data. So now there's actually a way to hide everybody's salary from the DBA, right, which we didn't have before. Uh, one of the problems with Always Encrypted is if you need to decrypt data at the client, what does that mean if you want to perform a search? You've got to ship all the data to the client and uh, perform the decryption, right? Otherwise, you can't, you can't search on the server. So if you're trying to filter, if you have a, a million row table and you're trying to search for people uh, with a certain, um, I don't know, if you've encrypted their, uh, their last name or their birth date or something and you're trying to search for people that were born a certain year, uh, that's going to be very hard with Always Encrypted because you can't, you, you have to do, you, you can't perform a range search on encrypted data because the encrypted data is garbled nonsense. So you have to send all that data to the client and then perform your search on the decrypted data. Well, in 2019, they added secure enclaves, which is a hardware-based, um, it's like a black box that sits on the machine and allows SQL Server to interact with that and send all of the data into the secure box and perform uh, range calculations there, which is much cheaper than doing it, sending it over the wire. 
requires certain hardware. Uh, there's some limitations there, but uh, they're, they're just trying to make that better, make that make always encrypted a, a more compelling story. There's a new uh, sensitivity classification, DDL, which previously they had in Management Studio, uh, they had a wizard. There was a, a UI screen that said, oh, classify your data, and it would try to pick out things that had obvious names like email or last name and tag it as specific things like personal data or financial data. Um, but what that would do behind the scenes, it, was it, it would just create extended properties, which are not very discoverable, uh, and they're not very, there's not really a whole lot uh, that you can do with that. What they did here with sensitivity classification is they actually added uh, a top-level DDL uh, classification for, uh, or yeah, classification that allows you to say, I want this data to be classified in this way. Uh, and the nice thing about that is, unlike extended properties, with the classification, auditing picks this up automatically. So if you have, if you add classification to a table and you say last name is PII, uh, personal identifiable information or uh, social security number. Oh, well, sorry. What do you? Call, what is it called here? Pes, pes, Petzel? Pesel. Okay. I knew I would get that wrong. Um, so you have your Pesel, and you want to um, you want to make sure that that's uh, designated as personal information, right? You don't want anybody to be able to, or just anybody to be able to access that. Um, so you can add that classification there. And now when you're auditing your data, if you're using SQL Server Audit, the classification that you added here comes in automatically, right? which wouldn't happen with the extended properties. So it's, an, it's just an added way to, uh, to automatically collect that information. All right, some availability things. So uh, one of the things they added was for CheckDB. Everybody runs CheckDB, right, all the time? I don't, yeah, I don't believe you. Yeah, so. um, but what can happen with CheckDB is it can take over a box. Right? You, can have, you can be running CheckDB, and it just takes over all the resources. And so this allows you to actually say, with, with Maxdoff, just like you would for a query that you wanted to prevent from going parallel or prevent from taking all the threads. Right? Um, you can do that for CheckDB as well. You can now specifically say, alter a column in this way and make it online, which just like with indexes, that means that while you're changing that column, the original version of the column is still available to queries. Um, there, uh, with each version of SQL Server, there are more and more scenarios where this happens automatically, but now you can explicitly say, I want to alter this column in an online way. Right? It comes a little bit in disk space, uh, but it provides much more availability to the, the original data while you're doing that. You don't have to take an outage. Okay. Resumable index rebuild, so I kind of already explained this. Um, when, I've, when I was talking about the database scope configuration, some of these things tie together, and it's really hard to order them in a way that um, allows you to talk about one without also having to talk about the other. Uh, resumable index rebuilds. Oh, so this, in 2017, resumable index rebuilds were added. And in 2019, it was resumable index create. Right? So uh, the rebuilds happened first. And then in 2019, which is yet, um, you'll have resumable index creates as well. And that you can also do, in 2019, you can do online create and rebuild of column store, clustered column store indexes, right, which you couldn't do before. Before, you had to take an outage for that. There's a new concept called accelerated database recovery. This could be a session on its own. This is, um, this is my favorite feature that they've added for 2019. What it does is it changes the way that uh, information is logged. So uh, logged operations that happen in SQL Server. Um, you have different kinds of things that happen. You have things that can be versioned. So if you change a, uh, a user's last name in a table, that's a versioned operation, right? So you can have, if you're using recommitted snapshot, you can keep track of the versions that have happened over time. Um, and it allows you to do things like have uh, readers that don't block other readers and uh, readers that aren't blocked by writers. With this, what this does is it actually takes some of the things that aren't versioned, like a bulk operation or uh, an alter to a table, things that, things that you can't have version copies of the rows for, and it separates them into a different transaction log. It's actually a, it's called an S-log. And by separating that information, what it means is that when you're recovering a database, um, there are three phases, right? There's an analysis phase, and then there's a redo phase, and an undo phase. And what the, the analysis phase does is it just takes, it 
takes an inventory of all the transactions that were uh, not committed when the server stopped, right? So if you have a hard crash, um, you have a failover, things like that, things happen and uh, transactions are left in this weird state. So analysis takes care of, uh, figures out what that is. Uh, redo commits all the transactions that uh, are able to be committed after the recovery. So it has to go through and read the entire transaction log, find all of those transactions, and recommit them. And then undo starts at the end of the log and reads backwards and reverts any transactions that were uncommitted when the database went down uh, that can't be committed now for various reasons. So it reads the entire transaction log again, going backwards and finding all of those things. So with this, by taking the versioned uh, information or the non-versioned information out of the transaction log and, and keeping it only in this S log, the amount of data that has to be processed during redo and undo is much smaller. Um, that's a gross simplification of the process. <laughs> like I said, this could be an entire session on its own, um, but this is going to be, I think, the killer feature in SQL Server 2019, is accelerated database recovery. Um, and there's not really any, there's not really anything you can do to take advantage of that, like there's no there's no new syntax or anything like that, except for you can control it um, using the uh, database scope configuration. So you can say that uh, accelerated database recovery is on or off for a database. Right? Why you would set it off, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. There are a lot of settings in SQL Server that I think nobody should ever turn off, but they do. So, um. all right, some performance things. So Query Store, anybody using Query Store for analyzing execution plans? Yeah, a couple. I've, I was expecting a lot more hands than that. How many people just don't want to answer questions? You can, yeah, yeah, there we go. Yeah. See, you can be honest with me. I'm not going to tell anybody. The recording, they'll edit it out of the recording if you put your hand up and you didn't want people to know. Uh, so what this does is it keeps track of all your query executions and the plans that went with them. Uh, and so it helps you spot uh, things like uh, regressions. So you have a query plan that, or you have a query, right? A query hash from a from a piece of query text that has run, and all of a sudden the query plan changes and duration goes way up, or reads go way up. Or, um, you can have all these scenarios. There's a, a video here. Don't write this down. Just download the slide. I, uh, I shouldn't have even put the URL on the on the slide because I've every time people like scrambling to write down the URL of the thing, just download the slide and click on it. It's much easier. Uh, but she has a video where she walks through the, the whole process, and it's a very, uh, um, very informative uh, session that she did. So there are some downsides, though, to Query Store. So the way that Query Store works is it stores um, all of the Query Store information in the user database. So if you have a if you have a database that's 10 gigabytes, and it, let's say you, um, I don't know, you run 100 million queries against that database a day your database is going to become 100 gigabytes. With, you can set limits on what Query Store collects, but there, you have to keep in mind that um, if you're trying to, you have to come up with this balance of how much space should I let Query Store take up and how much should I let it affect how long my backups take, how long a recovery will take in the event of a disaster, um, what, what kind of frequency I have to run my log, log backups, because th that could change based on how much data the database now collects that you're running Query Store. Uh, it's only supported on 2016 plus, so you can't use Query Store against older versions. There's a free, um, oh, I'm trying to remember the name of it now. Uh, Open Query Store, thank you. Uh, there's a, there's a, a free solution called Open Query Store that works against older versions. Um, and I haven't used it, I just know that it exists, so it's something to check out. Uh, and the other thing is when you're collecting all this information about plans, just like anything, you, you can tend to have an observer effect, which is the, the monitoring you're doing, the, things, the data that you're collecting to find information about performance is actually causing performance problems. So there are definitely uh, some types of workloads where um, this will actually make your workload worse. So you, don't, you probably don't want to do that. You want to make sure you do a lot of testing with Query Store before you run it. There's some intelligent query processing features, so they're making it, well, how do I say this the right way without being offensive? They're making it so that you can still write bad queries, but they'll actually perform okay. Right? So they're changing a bunch of things. They have uh, things like interleaved execution for multi-statement TVFs. So what this means is you have a, um, a multi-statement TVF, 
you have a table valued function. And one of the problems with those is that uh, you get really bad cardinality estimates. So what interleaved execution does is it will, as the query is running, um, or uh, when the query is compiling, sorry, it will go through and it will say, OK, when I get to this TVF, I'm going to stop and I'm going to recalculate my estimates based on what's available, what information about the statistics is available to me right now. And then I will determine what I'll do with, through the rest of the plan and how those estimates will affect the, the rest of the plan operation. So it kind of gets in the way and stops a really bad estimate from continuing to be used in a plan. There's a thing called batch mode adaptive joins. And this basically means if I can't perform a merge join and I have a choice between a hash join and a nested loop join, I'm going to determine at runtime, based on the statistics for the two tables that I'm trying to join, uh, I'm going to decide whether, I'm going to, whether it makes more sense to perform a nested loop join or a hash join. And so it run, every time the query runs, it, will it could potentially make a different decision. There's batch mode memory grant feedback. So when you're running in, in batch mode and uh, when you run an execution plan and it requests a certain memory grant based on uh, stats and the operations that are involved. And let's say that uh, the first time it, you ran, it says, OK, I, have this, I need this many rows. And that means I'll require a memory grant of 50 megabytes. So it runs the query, and it asks for 50 megabytes. It gets 50 megabytes, and it only uses 10 megabytes. Well, the next time that it tries to run that query, it's going to, uh, it's going to adjust how it creates a memory grant or uh, re how it requests a memory grant based on previous executions. Right? The reverse is also true if I say um, the first time it runs, it says, I'm going to need 50 megabytes. It asks for 50 megabytes. It actually uses 4 gigabytes. The next time it runs, it's going to ask for more instead of sticking with the original 50 megabyte estimate. In 2019, they added batch mode over row store. Row store. So batch mode is basically the ability, instead of uh, an operator handling every row one at a time, it can handle, uh, I think, 900. It can handle 900 rows at a time, and it processes things uh, much faster. Um, but initially, in 2006 or 2012, that only worked in uh, column store. So now in 2019, you can actually have this behavior uh, with, your, with tables that are uh, in row store. Excuse me. If table variable uh, deferred compilation. So what that means is that uh, when you're using a table variable in your code, and uh, you get really crappy estimates most of the time, right? Uh, what this does is it allows you to say, OK, when I have a table variable, I'm going to wait to compile uh, based on the stats until I see how many rows are actually in that table variable. All right, so it makes much better decisions about the plan uh, because of uh, how many rows are, are actually found in that table variable. And there's a prox count distinct. <coughs> uh, Rob Farley and I had a good conversation about this yesterday, actually. What this does is it replaces things like distinct count. So distinct count is very expensive, right? Because it has to, uh, it has to read the whole table, and it has to keep a hash table of all the distinct values, um, which ends up using a lot of memory right? in a lot of cases. You have a big table, and you have to keep track of all the distinct values in a table. You're reading through, and you're putting every new value you see into a bucket. Well, all those buckets add up very quickly. So if you're trying to count, do a count distinct on 5 billion rows, um, you can expect to use quite a bit of memory. A smart math person in the room could probably figure out how much. but. Um, with a prox count distinct, it actually um, experiments and keeps a much lower number of buckets and makes a guess at how much the prox count distinct will be. And so what this does is it allows you to have a lot more concurrency because you don't, you don't need all that memory and a lot faster execution if you are memory bound at a cost, right? It's an approximate, it's kind of like no lock, right? So you have this. Uh, margin of error. And what the documentation says is that 98% of the time, your, the guess that SQL Server makes will be within 2% of the actual. That's pretty good, I think. I mean, it, obviously, anything could be better. Anything that's not 100% could be better. But 98% of the time being within 2% is pretty good, pretty reliable. Uh, and in all of my testing so far, I've found that, and this is probably just because I haven't used a big enough data set yet, but I've found that the runtime was the same. 
So I I'm, I'm, wasn't memory bound. I wasn't on a system where there was a lot of high concurrency with a lot of memory grants. Um, the runtime was about the same, but my memory grant was 1% of the same query using count distinct, which means that I can, use, I can run 100 of those queries with the same memory as one count distinct. So it's a pretty powerful change. Uh, scalar UDF inlining. So scalar UDFs have been the bane of our existence since they were created. And uh, they always seem to cause problems unless you're just dealing with one row. Right? If you have a, a scalar UDF that's involved in a query in, in the where clause or in the join clause or in the select list, you find that uh, it gets executed once for every row. And if you're tracing, if you're doing statement level tracing, uh, it can kill your observer overhead. Right? It may, this trace just pounds on all these uh, scalar UDF calls. Uh, but you don't see them in the execution plan. Right? They don't show up there. So it, it's not obvious. When you're looking at the plan for a query that took a long time, you see the scalar uh, compute scalar operator, and you see that it references a function, but there's no hint there that it take that it ran a million times, and that's where all of your time was spent. And so what they've done is they've allowed uh, specific scalar UDF functions. There are a bunch of criteria here, but uh, specific scalar UDF functions can actually be inlined into the query. So just like when you're using a view, right? You have a view, and it, and you don't actually see the view as one of the uh, objects that's being operated on, right? Because it collapsed the actual logic behind the view into the query, or if you use a, a table-valued function, an inline table-valued function, you don't see that in the execution plan. And now you can have that with scalar UDFs as well. It encapsulates the logic that was in the UDF into the original query, and then the query plan has no, there's no dependency on the function anymore at all, except that it's in the query text. Uh, there's a new use hint. So we're writing a query. You can say use this hint, and uh, it allows you to specify the names of hints instead of um, trace flags. So how many people remember what all the trace flags they've ever used do? And if you if you went back to your code that you wrote three years ago that said option query trace on eight six four nine, how many people here would, could tell me what eight eight six four nine does? Probably not many, right? I mean, I, I, there are obviously a few, um, but uh, not many people could. So this allows you to use names that are um, equally hard to remember, but at least they, they are meaningful, right? So I couldn't type that from scratch most of the time. Probably most of us probably couldn't. Uh, but at least when you see that in your code, you know what it's doing. Right. And there are a bunch that were introduced in 2016. And these are the trace flags that they uh, replace, right? So if you're using any of these trace flags, you can now use this use hint uh, syntax to, to use one of these options. And then in 2019, the list is much bigger. And I don't have the, this is just the output from the, uh, the DMV, but uh, there are a bunch of things here. The most interesting one to me is the ability to specify on any individual query any supported compatibility level. So if you have a query that behaves best under a very specific compatibility level, you can have the query uh, hint this exactly so that when you go through upgrades or you change the database compatibility level, you don't have to worry about that query regressing because it's fixed to that compatibility level, which is pretty powerful. Some more performance enhancements. So they added some things to Whoa, sorry. Every time I move, I got, maybe I should stand like this. Um, so they added weight stats to show plan. So they show you the top 10, uh, up to the top 10 uh, weight stats that your execution plan or that your execution of that query waited on. Uh, they leave some out, like CX consumer. They leave out um, any of the benign weight types they leave out. Uh, but you can see those in the XML now. They also added UDF duration and UDF CPU. So they, you can't see, you still can't see it in the plan diagram. But at least in the XML, you can extract the fact that um, you know, this much CPU and this much time was spent inside of UDF, scalar UDF code. They added the trace flags that were in use, so you don't have to know that uh, when I was running, when I created this session and I started running queries against the system, I had some crazy trace flag enabled, and that's why I got this plan that I got, or that's why I, uh, the execution was slow. They, they actually store that information now, and they store whether it was session, uh, if, whether it's a, a session level trace flag or a statement level or uh, server wide. The stats that were, uh, that were used in the query. So you can actually get the statistics names and things like that in the, uh, in the execution plan. And there's a concept called row goals, which if you've ever used a top operator, you've been subject to this. So SQL Server makes a, 
basically a row goal that says I want to achieve at least this many rows. Uh, and so there are some metrics that are involved with that that you can use to troubleshoot queries. Grant could explain that way better than I could. Um, these are exposed in the XML now as well. And there's a new CX consumer weight type. So uh, anybody ever troubleshoot CX packet weights? Those are fun, right? So there are two different types of weights that actually happen there. And there are, I, I used to always call them good CX packet weights and bad CX packet weights. Uh, bad CX packet weights are the ones that happen when uh, two threads are doing a disproportionate amount of work. And so you have two threads that are, that are processing data, and one of them finishes while the other one is still processing work. And that's a bad CX packet weight because that thread is being wasted. Right? It's just sitting there idle waiting for the other one to finish. Um, the other type is when the producer, um, you know, the overall thread is, is asking for work from all of these threads. And there's a weight that accumulates there when all the threads are working. There's a weight that's accumulated. And all that really means is that parallelism is working. Um, that one is now exposed as a CX consumer. So they split those into two types. And so you're supposed to not have to worry about CX consumer weights. And if you see them, uh, it's not a problem. But there are some blog posts out there that show that there are cases where CX consumer actually does indicate a problem. So I wouldn't be quick to write that off. Uh, there's some new lightweight profiling. So there's a trace flag 7412 that was introduced in 2016 SP1 that allows you to um, collect information from the, or populate information in the sys DM exec query profiles, DMV, which allows you to see at any time uh, all the queries on the system that are running and see what the process or uh, what the status is of all of the operators in the plan. So if you've ever used uh, Management Studio and you say, show me the live query, I forget what they call it, live query profile or something, uh, and you can see the data moving in between the operators, that's how it does that. It uses that DMV. Um, and initially, it would only do that if you asked for it when you were running the query. And now you can do that uh, with a trace flag and set it server-wide. In 2019, this is actually the default behavior. So you can capture actual plans uh, from any, any session on the system without having to turn include actual execution plan on first. Uh, but it's not, the plans aren't identical. So they're close, but they don't have all of the information that uh, include actual execution plan would have. Um, some programmability stuff. So 2016 added uh, string split. So this was a big one for me because I've uh, solved this problem way too many times and way too many times in T-SQL. This really isn't where you should be doing this, but uh, sp string split surprised me quite a bit. Uh, it was the first implementation of it was lacking in features. You can't specify the order, and it only supports a single character delimiter, but it was fast as anything. Um, and any solution that I had implemented previously, this kicked the pants off of it, so it was much better. Uh, JSON support, anybody dealing with JSON? Yeah. So um, you have some support. It's not like Postgres, JSON B support. It doesn't have any of that uh, extensive things. It's just storing JSON as NVAR CarMax. Uh, but you have a bunch of functionality in there, like isJSON and JSON value and, and JSON query. There are a bunch of things you can do, uh, manipulate that data. And there's a function called string escape that helps you uh, take data that you have, right? some string that you have, and make it um, work with, make it compatible with JSON. So if you have uh, backslashes in there, it will escape them. And you don't have to do all of those replaces yourself. Uh, there's a new function called at time zone. And this allows you to um, not, uh, not have to deal with things like daytime offset. Daytime offset is, is OK for storing information and storing the offset from UTC. The problem is uh, it doesn't support uh, DST, daylight saving time, uh, which do you, guys, do you guys have DST here? You guys on summertime right now? Yeah. yeah. All right. So it's fun when you schedule a meeting before DST starts for after DST. And depending on the system you're using, it might, be able, it might take that into account, and it might not. Um, and if it doesn't, it probably use daytime offset uh, to, store that, uh, to store that data. So at time zone allows you to specify the time zone name and not think about, well, what's the offset? And uh, is it in DST at that time? And is it DST now? And all of these things. Compress and decompress, this is basically gzip and gunzip. 
right, in the database. So it allows you to, uh, to perform that without, people would install like CLR, custom CLR modules that would allow them to uh, perform gzip compression in the database. Now you can do it natively. In 2017, they had a string ag, so the opposite of string split, right? I want to I want to build a comma separated list from this set, uh, and I'm sure anybody who has done this used for XML path, which is kind of clunky and hard to memorize, and uh, puts this big block of XML path code into your queries. Now you can use string ag and do that uh, in one shot. Concat ws, this is concat with a separator, so you can just instead of saying plus you know, uh, first name plus comma plus last name plus comma, uh, you can actually just specify the comma once, and it will put a comma in between all of the values that you have. Trim, because we needed that. L trim, R trim was way too hard to type. They needed trim. Doesn't do anything differently, folks. It's just L trim and R trim. So good use of resources there. Uh, translate, so this one is interesting. Translate is a, um, it, it's basically multiple replace. So you, you specify a string of characters, and then specify uh, a string of replacement characters, and it walks through the string. And for each character in position one, it replaces it with uh, position one of the replacement string, position two, position two, and so on. I have a quick demo of these. I'm not going to do all of these, because we're going to run out of time. So string split. So this, in uh, if you were using a function, your function would be 30 lines long. It would be very inefficient. This just does it with a very simple string split call. Uh, string ag just builds the builds a comma separated string. You can specify any any character sequence there. So there, those are the databases on my system in a single comma separated list. And if you want them in a certain order, you can use the within group clause and say order by whatever. Right? So you get a guaranteed uh, order for the string ag, which most custom solutions you can't really, you would have to um, separate that out into a separate subquery to get them in the order. Right? So now those are, those are um, alphabetical order. I'm going to skip the JSON stuff. Uh, concat WS. So here's trim and concat WS. So I specified a plus sign here once, and then I have all these different things. And you can mix types, you can mix variables and constants and, and all of those things, right? Right, so there's concat WS. I'm gonna skip at time zone. Well, no, you know what, let's do at time zone. So I've got some people here. One person's in uh, GMT, one person is in, some, well, I'm here right now, we're Central European time, right? And I have a friend, Paul, who's in Pacific. And I'm just going to select uh, UTC to be the sys daytime offset. And local time is sys daytime offset at their time zone. So you just have to know the time zone name. You don't have to know if it's standard or daylight time right now. You just say standard. The system will figure it out. The first time I, th I saw this, I was like, well, why am I saying standard? That means I have to know, but you don't. It's, the system figures it out. Right. So there we have John, Aaron, and Paul, and the, the sysdaytime offset according to the server. So the current time offset at the server is at 9.45, right? So that's UTC time, which makes sense. And then the adjusted time, so someone in GMT right now, it's 10.45. Here it's 11.45. That means I have five minutes left. And uh, someone on the west coast of the US, it's two in the morning. Right? So I don't have to think about the offsets. I didn't have to know that uh, Pacific time is seven hours off of UTC or eight hours off of UTC, depending on DST. Um, I don't have to memorize all of that. I just have to know the names of the time zones. Uh, yeah, and that's just compression, so OK. Some other stuff that, that I don't know anything about. Um, UTF-8 support, anybody using UTF-8 data? A couple, okay. So they have new collations that allow you to store it. Um, uh, well, sorry, in 2016, they added the ability to store UTF data in Unicode uh, using bulk methods. So you could store, you could bulk insert UTF data, you would store it in Unicode, and you would pay the penalty of Unicode. In 2019, there are new uh, UTF-8 collations 
that actually only require, it, it's like uh, NVARCAR compression. It only requires the uh, extra storage when you actually have characters there that require it. So it stores it as uh, Latin if it can. There's graph support. I mean, I can spell graph. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's about all I can do with that. Um, I just know that these exist. So if you're using these, you now have the ability to have constraints. On, uh, you can have edge constraints, and you also have merge support, uh, even though I will fight anybody who, uh, who thinks that they need to use merge, because I don't think you should. Uh, we can talk about that tomorrow. Uh, and then Java. So like R and Python, they added uh, Java as a language that you can use to uh, build machine learning and uh, AI um, applications inside of SQL Server. My favorite fix uh, in the last years is the string of binary data would be truncated message. So this is absolutely useless, right? You get you, you insert 5,000 rows into a table that has 14 columns, and you get string or binary data would be truncate, truncated. Thank you, SQL Server. That's very helpful. Um, this probably goes over. You probably see a different message, right? If you use Polish language, that that message probably doesn't ring any bells with you. But uh, for me, this is like a nightmare from 2000 on. Uh, the message is a lot better now. So if I insert into a table, it actually tells me uh, the table name and the column name, and it tells me the truncated value, which isn't as useful as the full value, but it's a start. Right? So I can actually get uh, some information about well, which table, which column, which row, what, like, what was the problem. Right? So that's a lot, uh, a lot more helpful. Uh, so this was introduced in uh, 2019, but it was actually backported. So if you're running 2016 and 2017, you can get this. You need to use a trace flag to turn it on, though because they don't want to break your, if you have a, an application already that relies on the, full, the, the truncated message, ironically, uh, that you get now, uh, they don't want to break your application. So you have to actually enable it with a trace flag. Uh, in 2019, it's the default if you use compat level 150, but you can turn it on or off per database using uh, database scope configura configuration. So if you're bringing a database forward into 2019 and you have an application that's going to break if it suddenly gets this different message, uh, you can turn that feature off so that for that database, it still uses the old message. Uh, and that's all I have. So I hope I uh, provided some good, valuable information about new features, new T-SQL and DDL in 2016, 2017, and 2019. Thank you.